going to have a look at the book uh, which is commonly known as the as the Bible, and which refers to itself as the Scriptures, and in some places as the Word of God. This this book, the Bible, is uh, I believe the completely inspired Word of God, and therefore. It is entirely true, and it is infallible. You see, it's not a matter or a question of translation. The, the translation of the Bible, which was originally written in Greek and Hebrew, um, which, which I'm going to use tonight, is the authorised version or the common version. And it was translated out of the original languages in the year 1611. Um, I accept that there may be some weaknesses in this translation, uh, some inadequacies in how it has translated and represented the original languages. But that's not what we're going to talk about this evening. Nor, nor is it a case of manuscripts. Uh, there are some differences, especially in the Greek texts of the New Testament, um, we, uh, and scholars, you know, have poured over the various extant texts of the New Testament and have different views on the variances. But w when you look at them in, in the round, the, the, the differences that exist in the Greek texts are rarely material. Uh, there's only a small number, and the vast majority are of a, a very minor uh, uh, are very minor in their nature. It's accepted that with a document of the age and antiquity of the Bible, there will be some errors in transcription because uh, copies were actually made by hand by scribes. It's not about those possible transcriptional and translational differences. And in actual fact, you know, they're trivial when you compare the Bible uh, with the evidence of extant texts of the Greek classics. If you take Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, that there's a huge divergence in the extant uh, Greek manuscripts of those two books. It's absolutely massive. The Bible's nothing like that. And it, it's not even a matter of not actually possessing the, the, the manuscript that Samuel the prophet or David wrote. Because... If you look at a, a, a modern book, a modern classic, it is very rare, actually, for you to have the actual handwriting of the author. Um, you know, if you look at the book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, that was written by T.E. Lawrence, also known as Lawrence of Arabia, it went through many iterations as he refined what he wanted to say. <laughs> Which one is the original? Was it the one that he lost on Reading Station? Well, uh, that illustrates the point that even with modern classic uh, books, you, you will never get back to what uh, we might call the autographed version. So it's not a matter of, uh, of, of transcription. It's not a matter of translation. Uh, that was in, in the hands of, of, of men and it has no bearing on our subject this evening. What we want to talk about is the actual inspiration of the book, which we call the Bible. Now, this subject is rarely considered in any, or examined in any, any detail. And I want you to listen carefully while I explain to you uh, the nature of the Bible and the way in which it was inspired. This evening, in this lecture, I don't want to necessarily convince you that you should believe in the Bible, although I wish that everybody did. But really the purpose of the lecture is to help you to understand what you have in front of you so that you can then go away and consider its worth. The inspiration of the Bible has often been called into question uh, in, in this country. Historically, over the complete period of, 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 of Christianity, the vast majority of professing Christians have believed that the, 
uh, Bible is utterly true and is the word of God, and they've revered it as such. But during the 1800s, and especially in the 1900s, there has been increasing disrespect for this view. But, you know, you should not be uh, uh, swayed by relatively modern views concerning the Bible. In terms of history, modern views are in the great minority. And in actual fact, those that hold them have nothing to put in place of the Bible. You see, the modern universities of this country teach you to question everything. They teach you to disbelieve and to doubt rather than to believe. But if the Bible says anything, the Bible say, says that God is not interested in doubters. Those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But, you know, the shades of disbelief. Uh, some reject outright the inspiration of the Bible and some take a more seemingly measured approach and say, well, some of it might be inspired, but some of it isn't. In other words, it's only partly the word of God. And the logical consequence of that view is that it must therefore be a mixture of God's words and man's words. Uh, and some then say, well, what about the word inspiration? Does inspiration really mean that it's infallible? That they're all views that have been brought to the fore in the, in the last 100 or so years, 150 years. And as we're going to see this evening, they are extremely discreditable. And no one who holds them can really pretend to be a disciple of Christ in any sense of the word. Now, to begin at the source, the God of the Bible reveals certain things about himself and what he does. And I'd like you, first of all, to turn to the first chapter of John's Gospel record. And we're going to read the first verse. So this is the Gospel record of John. And we're just going to read the, the, the introducing verse of this gospel record. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. What does that mean when it says the word was with God and the word was God? Well, the way I'd explain it to you is that the word, the word that is spoken of in this verse is really uh, indicating the thoughts and the reasoning of God. And that's the sense in which the word was with God and it actually was God. The word is his thoughts. It's his power of, 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 of reason. And the, 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 the Bible is the representation in writing of his thoughts and his reasoning. Now, if you go to the epistle of Paul to Titus, uh, in the New Testament scriptures, it's just after the epistles of Timothy, you come to the epistle of Paul to Titus. You see that the Bible claims that the word of God it, 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 it is absolutely true because God cannot lie. Look at it. It's Titus chapter one, and we're going to read the first three verses. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth in, 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 of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so there you have it. God cannot lie. And this book, the Bible, uh, is his word. Now, the psalmist speaks um, of the word of God in terms of its purity. He looks at it in, in, a, in a slightly different way. Um, we've had an indication of that in, in our reading, but I'd like you to turn to Psalm 12. And here, here you'll see that uh, the Old Testament scriptures, and we're going to go through a mixture of Old Testament scriptures and New Testament scriptures this evening to prove what we have to say. The Old Testament scriptures talk of the word of God being pure. Look at Psalm 12 and verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. 
And there's a, a figure of speech uh, being spoken of here. It, it, it's talking about the refining process of silver. And you can refine and refine silver time and time again to get all the impurities out of it. Uh, and the Bible in, in, in the sacred style, in the divine way, says, it. look, the Bible's like silver that's been pure, purified seven times. In other words, it's completely pure. And that's how I re regard the scriptures of truth. They are the completely pure words of God. So in summary... Uh, the Bible, the word of God, is one with God. It's his thought and it's his reasoning. Uh, it's true because God cannot lie. And it is, it is pure. It is, it is the pure thought and reasoning of God. Now, I want to turn back to the New Testament, to the Gospel record of John, because I want to show to you that Jesus Christ, who all Christians profess to follow, believed in the infallibility of the scriptures. So let's go now to John's Gospel Report in chapter 10. And we're going to see that Jesus believed that the scriptures were infallible. They could not err. John's Gospel Record, chapter 10 and verse uh, 34. Jesus uh, is speaking here and he says, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, you see there the, the Christ calls the scriptures the word of God. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. And that was the view of Jesus, of the scriptures. He believed that they were the word of God. That's how he describes them. And he says they can't be broken. They can't be proved to be false. They can't be destroyed. Uh, and that is, uh, brothers and sisters and interested friends, because they are true. And what Jesus is saying is that they will, not only are they true, they will, they will defy all attempts to destroy them. Now, the absolute truth of the Bible, uh, of the word, is also claimed by Jesus. And we're going now to the Gospel record of John and chapter 17. It's only a short verse, but it's actually based on uh, some words in, in the psalm which we, we had read. And you'll probably recognise them uh, when, when I read them to you. It's John chapter uh, uh, seven, uh, 17. Uh, and we going to read verse 17 as well. Sanctify them through thy word. He's talking about his, he's, he's, he's asking God to sanctify his disciples. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so there you are. The, the, Christ is saying that the word of God is the truth. Uh, therefore, um, Jesus believed in the infallibility and the absolute truth of the scriptures. Now, that's critical when we try to evaluate the teaching of Christ, because, you know, if Christ rose from the dead, then his teaching must be true. Therefore, belief of his teaching concerning the scriptures and belief in the resurrection of Christ are one of the same thing. If you don't believe in, in the Bible, you don't believe in the resurrection of, of, of the dead. But if you do believe that Christ really rose from the dead, then he must be the son of God and his words must be true. And he is saying to us that the Bible is true. Now, the claim of the scriptures is that the word of God actually not only is true, it's not only infallible, but it also has divine properties. Um, and when we look at um, John chapter 17 and the verse that we've just read, Jesus is saying that God's word has the ability to sanctify a person. Verse 17 again, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. 
So it's not just the case of a black and white text. What Jesus is saying about God's word is it, it has an intrinsic power. And that power that it has is a divine power. It has the ability to sanctify somebody. Now, in, in biblical terms, that means that the word of God is most holy. Uh, that's what sanctification is about. And not only is it most holy, it has the, the power to make people who believe it holy. That's the concept of something being most holy. It's able to impart its holiness to others. Uh, in other words, you know, it, it's like the altar in Moses' tabernacle. That was described as being most holy because whoever touched it became holy. And that's what Jesus is saying about the word of God. He's saying that if you, if you believe his word, it has the ability to make you holy. So it's actually got a power all, all of itself. Let's go to the uh, book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. And verse 16. And here we have the Apostle Paul's description of the word of God. He calls it here the gospel. I am not ashamed, he says. This is Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, if you believe that the Bible is the power of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If you believe that God's word, the Bible, has the power to sanctify, it can't therefore be man's words. It can't be a mixture of man's words because, because of what Christ is claiming for the Bible. He's claiming that it has this power all of itself. Now, in the days of the Old Testament, uh, before the flood, and afterwards in the days of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, God occasionally appeared to the patriarchs of Israel, and he spoke to them. But in the days of Moses, he began to speak to his people through the mouth of prophets. It all stems, to, stems back to the book of Exodus, to chapter 20 of Exodus, where God was addressing the people from off the heights of Mount Sinai. And the nation of Israel became extremely scared of the voice. It was so powerful and so formidable to them. And this is what they said. Verse 19 of Exodus chapter 20. They said to Moses, speak there with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And from that day forward, God generally spoke to his nation through holy men or prophets. And those men received the word of God and they spoke exactly what they heard uh, and they wrote it down as God instructed, to, instructed them. On occasions, God commanded the holy men to write down, specifically to write down his word. And when they did this, they wrote down exactly what God told them to write. They didn't mix it with what they thought themselves. They wrote down exactly what God had told them to, 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 to write. And the point that I'm making here is that the fact that a human agency was used to physically write down the word of God didn't less, lessen the message or, 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 or didn't detract from it in any way. The fact that a man wrote it on a piece of paper still meant that it was the word of God. I'm going to take you through a series of examples, three uh, New Testament passages that are all describing the same thing. And I want you to notice the, the, the small differences uh, in what is actually said. They're all inspired. They're all true. They don't conflict with one another, but they're just presenting the truth in a slightly different way. Let's turn, first of all, to Luke's Gospel Record in chapter 20. It's Jesus who's talking in, these, in all of these passages, and he's describing what happened when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Let's have a look at Luke chapter 20 and verse uh, uh, 37. And let's read very carefully what Jesus says about this incident. 
Luke chapter 20 and verse 37. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. So there uh, Jesus says that Moses showed uh, that God is the God of the, uh, 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 is not the God of the dead, but is the God of the living through what he said. Now, that is absolutely true because the passage that Jesus is referring to is in the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, and you'll find it there in the book of Exodus and chapter three. Now, let's go to Mark's gospel record in chapter 12, and we're going to read the, the same incident and the same words of Jesus, but they're just expressed in a slightly different way. Mark chapter 12 and verse uh, 26. Mark 12, verse 26. As touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses? Well, that's slightly different words, but it's saying the same thing. Have you read it in the book of Moses? How in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. They erred because they didn't believe the scriptures, uh, brethren, sisters, and interested friends. That's very slightly different. But it's the same, really, isn't it? Now let's go to the Gospel record of Matthew, Matthew chapter 22. And here we're going to re read Matthew's wholly inspired account of the same incident. And look what he says. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 31. All we're doing is comparing three inspired accounts of the same incident. Matthew 22 and verse 31, but us touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? So it was God speaking through Moses, saying, I am the, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Jesus says, God is speaking to you. In the other place, he says, haven't you read it in the book of Moses? And what he's saying is that what is written in the book of Moses is God speaking to us. It's the word of God. Let me do this again. Let's go to uh, Mark's gospel record. Uh, and we're going to have a look at a passage in uh, ch chapter seven of Mark's gospel record. And it's verse 10 that we want to, 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 to look at. And here Jesus is, is talking about what Moses had written. And he uh, draws the attention of his hearers to one of the commandments that is found in, in the book of Moses. Mark chapter 7 and verse 10. For Moses said, honour thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's what Jesus says Moses said, and he did say that. Let's go to the record in Matthew, Matthew's gospel record and chapter 15. And let's see how the, the same Holy Spirit, the one author of the scripture, um, presents uh, the same incident to us. Matthew chapter 15 and verse uh, four. For God commanded, saying, honour thy father and thy mother and mother and he that curseth father or mother let him die the death one says moses said it and the other one says that god said it because moses was inspired by god and what moses wrote in the first five books of the bible is the word of god and that degree of inspiration that degree of uh, of, of authorship of authorship is absolute and it covers every word that occurs in the Bible. And not only, just to be pedantic, not only does it cover every word, it covers every part of a word. Let's go to Luke's Gospel record 
uh, and, and, and chapter 16. And look at what Jesus says. And you might say to me, well, David, this is a figure of speech. It's hyperbole. But it, uh, it wouldn't be a, a very good figure of speech if, it, if there wasn't truth in it. Look at, look at Luke chapter 16 and verse 17. It is easier. This is Luke 16 and verse 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. And a tittle was a very small marking, part of a word. And he says, even to that extent, the law cannot fail. It, it must be fulfilled. And the implication is, of course, that it is the word of God. You see, the fact that a, a, a man was involved in, 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 in writing down what he heard God said didn't introduce a human element into the scriptures. Let's go to the second epistle of Paul to Timothy, the second epistle of Paul to Timothy. Uh, and we're going to have a, a, a look at um, chapter three and verse uh, 16. And look at what it says in this verse. Chapter three of Second Timothy and verse sixteen. Remember, remember what we've what Christ has said about sanctify them through Thy word. Thy word is truth, because that's definitive of what inspiration is. All Scripture is. This is Second Timothy three and verse sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. And so all scripture, not just part of it, not just the odd book here or the odd chapter or half a chapter, all scripture is given uh, by inspiration of God. So that precludes part of the scripture being inspired and part of it not being inspired, part of it being the word of man. Uh, take, for example, uh, a writer like Moses. Moses was personally involved in the things that he wrote. He, he took part in some of the historic accounts that he describes in the book of Exodus, uh, the book of Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. He's mentioned there and his, his own actions, he records his own actions. <clears throat> the, fact, the fact that he knew what happened because he was there, didn't, doesn't alter the fact of inspiration. What he actually wrote was not what he personally recollected and then he added what God told him. What he wrote was the word of God. Moses' writings are part of the scripture and therefore uh, they are entirely inspired. All scripture is inspired of God. And the word inspired that you find written there in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 means it's breathed by God. It's come out of his mouth. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that shows to you that it's simply not the word of man. Um, Moses wrote an, under inspiration. He wrote under divine commandment. And if you go to the second epistle of Peter, the second epistle of Peter, chapter uh, 1, um, the Apostle Peter explains what it was like to, to, to write under inspiration. Look at what he says uh, in, in this passage. We're going to start reading uh, verse uh, 20 of the second epistle of Peter in chapter 1. Knowing this first, that no prophecy, that's no prophecy in the Old Testament scriptures, is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved uh, by the Holy Spirit. So what, what he means when he says it's not of private interpretation, what, what he's saying is the scriptures don't contain something that the prophet dreamt of himself. That's what it means. It, they didn't come off the prophet's own volition. Prophecy in old time didn't come by the will of man. There's no human element in it. Uh, what happened is that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It was God dictating. It was God breathing the words uh, 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 to, to them. 
You see, if you go back to the Old Testament scriptures, and I'm going to take you now to the book of, of Ezekiel, there was a history in Israel of men who pretended to be prophets. And I'm going to take you to an example in Ezekiel chapter 13. Uh, we're going to read the first three verses where Ezekiel records certain false prophets that were uh, there in his day and that were opposing what God was teaching. Um, chapter 13 of Ezekiel and verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. They prophesied of their own volition of their own private interpretation. And they then said to the people, hear the word of, 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 of the Lord. And the Lord, thus saith the Lord, woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Th that was commonplace in Israel. But Peter is saying that what was recorded in the scriptures, that was not like this what the holy men of God who wrote the scriptures heard was the word of God, and they wrote it down exactly uh, as they heard it. Let me take you to a, a passage, in, another passage in the Old Testament. It's the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs, and, chap and we're going to have a look at uh, chapter 30 of, uh, of the Proverbs. And I want you to notice the precision of the language here. Chapter 30 and verse 5, every word of God is pure. It's not just some, it's every word uh, that is pure. Now, you might say to me, well, that, that's, that's it is a, a, as it may be. But what does it mean in uh, Timothy when it says all scripture? What is the scripture? What does the Bible define as, be, as being the, the scripture? Well, the, the, the Bible actually gives its own definition, more or less, of what it regards the scriptures to be. I want you to turn to the last chapter uh, of the gospel record of Luke, and we'll begin to see what the, what the Bible means when it talks about the scriptures. Luke's gospel record and we're going to have a look at chapter 24, and it's the record of, of, of Jesus initially uh, on the road to Emmaus. Let's just have a look um, at verse 27. Jesus is expanding the scriptures to two of his disciples. And he says, look, in verse 26 of, of Luke 24, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So the scriptures there, you can see, is the writings of Moses. That's the first five books of the Bible and all the prophets. And, you know, you might think, well, that covers, that covers everything from, from, from uh, uh, the, the book of Isaiah onwards. Yes, it does. But, you know, Samuel was a prophet and he wrote the first two books of the books of Samuel. And when you look at this, the, the first uh, the first Kings and second Kings, you'll see that there are quote, extensive quotations uh, between the book of Kings and the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah. They were the work of prophets. And so you've there got covered most of the Old Testament scriptures. And when you move on in Luke uh, 24 and you look at uh, verse 44, you see that the list becomes even more extensive. He said unto them, this is verse 44, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He's talking about what we know as the Old Testament scriptures. And that's what the Bible calls the scriptures. And that is what was inspired. Um, the, 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 the scriptures, and you might want to think about this, uh, also included books that had yet to be written. Now, let me explain what I mean. I want you to turn to the prophecy of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10, because Daniel had a had a series of visions given to him 
and angels communicated to him. And it's what those angels said to, to him that is really very, very, very interesting. Daniel chapter 10 and verse, uh, uh, we're going to look at verse 21, but an angel was talking to Daniel and he, he was describing how he was manipulating or persuading the kings of Persia to do certain things that he didn't really want to do, but which God had said must happen. And then he says in verse 21, but I will show thee, Daniel, what is noted in the scripture of truth. So I'm going to show to you what is in the scriptures. Now, Daniel hadn't heard this yet, and he therefore hadn't been able to write it down, but it's still called the scripture because the word of God, the word that God breathes is the scripture, and he knows the end from the beginning. Let me take it a little bit further forward. Um, we, we, we've shown how Jesus describes the Old Testament as the scriptures. Well, I want to take you to um, the first epistle Paul to Timothy. And we're going to have a look at chapter five, because here we have this, this word occurring again, the, the reference to the scriptures. Uh, it's 1 Timothy chapter five, and we're going to read uh, verse 18. And here's the Apostle Paul, and he's quoting from the scriptures. And look what he says about them. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And it does say that. And you, 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 you'll find that written uh, in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 25. And then he says, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. Now, where does the scripture say that? We can find the first quote. Where's the second quote? Well, I'll tell you exactly where it is. It's in the Gospel record of Luke. Luke chapter 10. And verse, we're going to read the seventh verse. We're not going to go into a great deal of detail here, but it's Luke chapter 10. And, uh, uh, and we're just going to read verse seven. There's some words of Jesus. And he says, in the same hour, in the same house, remain eating and drinking such things as they give for the labourer is worthy of his hire. And that is the passage of scripture that is quoted in Timothy. And so the Gospels, the part the New Testament is, re is, is regarded by the Apostle Paul as being the scriptures. Now, some have argued, you know, that the Bible seems to, to contain unnecessary facts. And while we're in Timothy, the second epistle of Timothy, the, there's a, there's, this passage is often quoted by those who, who seek to, to denigrate and, and, uh, the, the, the scriptures. They say, well, well look at this passage. What, what, the second of Timothy, chapter four. Uh, and verse 13, and here's the Apostle Paul writing, and he's talking about a cloak. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. And, and they say, well, is that inspired scripture? Surely it's just a, an instruction from one man to another. But it was written under commandment. And it shows that Paul had a love of the ministry. He, he, he preferred parchment so that he could write the word of God rather than his own personal comfort. So some scholars have come to the Bible and said, well, look, each book of the Bible has got its own unique character. Look at the gospel record of Luke. Luke allegedly uses Greek words which have got a medical connotation. And he was a doctor. And that's true. Uh, and you'll also find that Luke, when he writes in the Acts of the Apostles, he always mentions the port of departure when Paul was going on a voyage and, and the port of arrival. But he, he doesn't mention many of the towns when Paul was preaching the gospel on foot, I mean, certain towns, but he always mentions the ports. And scholars have said, well, that's typical of a Greek, a lover of the sea. That's a human element in, in, in the Bible. 
And then they go to the Old Testament and they read the prophecy of Amos and it's written in really rustic herdsman's language. And they say, well, that's Amos's words, not God's words. And they go, they go to, to, to Isaiah and they see some of the, the, the really fine poetry and there they say, well, look, that's the words of a scholar, uh, the words of a, an educated courtier. And the implication is that there is a human element in the word of God. It's not true. You see, God not only chose his words carefully, he also chose the men who were going to write those words down. He chose the words and he chose the vessel. And when he, wa when he wanted to communicate in a rustic way, he chose a herdsman of Tekoa to do it. When he wanted to reason with, with the Jews of Rome, he chose a Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisee, the Pharisees, the Apostle Paul, who had command of language, and he put his words into, a, into the mouth of a fitting vessel. It's apples and apples and pears and pears. God chose the word, and he chose the vessel that communicated it. Now, you might say, Ah, but when you come to the words of the Apostle Paul, he didn't, he, he, he didn't always just write what he was commanded to write. And that leads us to the first epistle of Paul in chapter 7. The first epistle of Paul, chapter 7. And we're going to see what it says in verse 6. Here, here Paul is giving uh, guidance concerning marriage. And this is, this is what he says in verse six. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And so some say, well, look, if he wrote it by permission, it wasn't something that God commanded him to write. So, you know, how can that be the word of God if it wasn't written at God's command? But let's compare that with other words that, are, that occur in the same epistle. Let's go to the first epistle of Paul, which, uh, to the Corinthians again, chapter 14. And let's see Paul's own estimation of what he was writing. The first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 14 and verse 37. Look at what he says. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. In other words, what the Apostle Paul wrote was placed on equal terms with the commandments of Christ. That's what the scriptures say. You go to the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to have a look at verse 17, uh, verse 17, the second epistle, chapter 2, and verse 17. Look, at, look carefully at what the apostle says. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. He hadn't corrupted it by putting his own words in. But as of sincerity, but as of God, we, uh, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. His words were, in, Paul, in other words, is claiming inspiration for the things uh, which he wrote. Now, if you read the Bible carefully, you will see that sometimes in the New Testament scriptures, on many occasions, actually, there is what we call a quotation. The writer uh, of the New Testament is referring back to the Old Testament scriptures and quoting them. And we've seen a couple of of examples of that, what saith the scripture uh, in, the, in, in, in the teaching of Christ and the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Now, if you look, look carefully and you compare what is written in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, you will see that on occasions there are differences. The words differ. There might be a completely different word in the same quotation. Does that mean that the New Testament writer was quoting from a translation that wasn't quite right? Is that, is that our explanation of, of these discrepancies? Does it mean that there's actually a discrepancy between the two passage, passages of scripture? What's the explanation when a passage 
differs very slightly from the uh, passage that is being referred to in the Old Testament scripture. We need to understand these things and we need to, to, to understand what is going on. Well, let me tell you this. There is one author of the scripture. It was written through men, but there is one single author from the book of Genesis right through to the book of Revelation. And what is happening is when Matthew says that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophet so and so. What is happening is that God, through the prophet, through through Matthew, is repeating his own words. And it's God's prerogative to repeat his own words and to repeat what he has previously said and to use slightly different words. When you when you tell tell a tale to your friends, you might use different. You might tell the same tale, but you'll describe it differently. Well, God does that. He repeats his own words and he expands on them and he enlarges them and he explains them. And God has every right to do that. It's not discrepancy. It's not the New Testament referring to some Septuagint translation. It's God explaining and developing his words so that we can understand them better. God has never, ever had to correct his words because every word of God is true. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Uh, this is the passage that we have read. And I just want to refer to the last verse uh, which we read in, in that psalm. Psalm 119. And verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning. And it is, it's never had to have been corrected. It's consistent. Sometimes the words differ because God explains things in a different way. But God's word is true from the beginning. And that verse proves that the book of Genesis and the account of creation it's the holy inspired scripture and that what Moses wrote through inspiration about the creation of the heavens and the earth is absolutely true. The principal uh, question in all these things you see is the sovereignty of the divine word. The divine word um, is to be accepted as uh, a sovereign power in our minds. It's intended to rule, our, to rule us and to rule our thoughts. But if, if, if a professed Christian puts himself in a position where he is deciding which part of the Bible to believe because he thinks that some of it has been written by a man and some of it by God, that, 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 that puts him in, in the position of being a judge over the word. He's sitting there saying, well, which part shall I, shall, I, shall I believe? Shall I believe this verse or that verse? I think this verse was written by God, and I think this one was written by a man. And that puts him uh, as a judge of the scriptures, and it elevates him over the scriptures. And that's what you're doing if you believe that the Bible is partially inspired. Whereas in actual fact, the opposite is true. The Bible is fully inspired. Every word of God is true. And it's us that are meant to be subject to the word of God and not the other way around. Let's turn to uh, Psalm 138 and verse 2. And here we see the true status of God's word. Psalm 138 and verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The word is peerless, brothers and sisters. It is the thought and the reason of God. Well, there were many other things that, um, believe, that professed believers of the Bible say about it. But I've tried uh, in this talk to give you a fair representation of what the critics say about the Bible uh, and to give you the Bible's response to them. And I hope that what I've been able to set before you shows to you the character of the Bible, that it is true, 
that it actually has a sanctifying property uh, and that you can have an absolute confidence that the Bible in its entirety is the absolute, completely inspired and truthful word of God. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>